Great, I will get started. Welcome everybody to the 10th annual Remembering Downwinders event. I'm Danielle Endries, I'm going to serve as the moderator tonight and I'm a member of the Utah Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons. We're a group based in Salt Lake City, Utah and we're focused on nuclear weapons abolition with a council of organizers who work via consensus. Many of our UCAN members are participating tonight, but I wanna quickly mention two, uh, Deb Sawyer, who's the head of the Utah Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, and then uh, Marcus Pegasus, who has put great um, efforts into help with this event and is also helping to monitor our YouTube live stream for questions when we get to the portion of this event that will be questions. Mm -hmm. So I want to begin with a land acknowledgement. Uh, we many, I am joining from Utah and what settlers know as Utah is the traditional ancestral and ongoing land base of Ute, Shoshone, Goshute, Diné, and Paiute peoples. We recognize the enduring relationships between many indigenous peoples and their homelands. We're grateful for the territory on which we gather today. We respect Utah's indigenous peoples, and we value the sovereign relationships that exist between tribal governments, state governments, and federal governments. Today, approximately 60,000 American Indian and Alaska Native peoples live in Utah, and we encourage you joining us from places outside of Utah to recognize the indigenous peoples on, whom, on whose territory you are joining us from tonight. Before introducing the panelists, I wanna give some background on the event. The, the United States federal government recognized January 27th as a national day of remembrance for Americans who during the Cold War worked and lived downwind from nuclear testing sites and were adversely affected by the radiation exposure generated by the above ground nuclear weapons testing. So the Remembering Downwinders Day, January 27th. We have an impressive panel to inform you about the perspectives of downwinders from a variety of different contexts and locations, dealing with the repercussions of being downwind from different stages in the nuclear weapons production process from cradle to grave. I wanted to also quickly mention that today is also uh, a day of Holocaust remembrance. So two really important events to be thinking about. So first I will introduce the panelists very briefly, and then each panelist will have some time to um, have opening comments. And then we will open it to Q and A from those of you that are watching from our YouTube stream. And if you have a question, you can type it into the comments on the YouTube stream. And then I will moderate the question and answer period based on those questions. And then there will be some closing remarks from each panelist. And then, and then we will be done. So we plan this event to go from 7 to 8.15 p.m. One final reminder, um, if you are watching via our YouTube channel, please subscribe to this YouTube channel. You can click subscribe and uh, then you'll have access to more information and events uh, that we do uh, through the YouTube, YouTube channel. And you can also find us on utahcan.org. That's our website. So now I wanna to move to introductions of our amazing women that we have tonight. So first, and these are in alphabetical order, uh, Tina Cordova is co-founder of the Tula Rosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. Uh, Ms. Cordova supports the communities which were unknowing, unwilling and uncompensated innocent victims of the first nuclear blast on, on earth at the Trinity site in South Central New Mexico. TBDC hopes the attention they bring will result in much needed healthcare coverage and compensation to the peoples of New Mexico who have suffered from overexposure to radiation since 1945. Next, we'll have Mary Dixon, writer, journalist, activist, and playwright. Mary Dixon is a downwinder with a compelling story to share. Her play, Exposed, was nominated for the Steinberg Award for Best New Play Produced Outside of New York. Recently, she was a featured speaker at Still Here, 75 Years of Shared Nuclear Legacy, 
a national event commemorating the 75th anniversary of the bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the Alliance for Nuclear Accountability has recognized her for her lifetime work on behalf of downwinders. Next, we have Leona Morgan is a Diné activist and community organizer. She co-founded Diné No Nukes to address uranium mining as part of the entire nuclear fuel chain. She also co-founded the Nuclear Issues Study Group, a multiracial and multi-generational volunteer organization based in Albuquerque, New Mexico, which works to protect New Mexico from all things nuclear. Leona collaborates with local, regional, and national groups as part of the international campaign, Don't Nuke the Climate, that focuses on nuclear energy as a global climate issue. And she attended the University of New Mexico and lives in Albuquerque. And then our last panelist is Trisha Pritikin. She was born and raised downwind on the Hanford Nuclear Weapons Facility. Her new book, The Hanford Plaintiffs, Voices from the Fight for Atomic Justice was the winner for the history, was the winner for history at the San Francisco Book Festival in 2020, and the winner for nonfiction at the New England Book Festival in 2020. Like Mary, Trisha was a participant at Still Here, 75 years of shared nuclear legacy. She serves as the chair of uh, Consequences of Radiation Exposure a nonprofit dedicated to increasing public awareness of the toll of nuclear weapons production and testing globally. So we are so lucky to have this esteemed panel of women who have devoted so much of their time and energy towards downwinder issues and raising awareness. So with that, I would like to ask each panelist to have an opening statement and we will start with Tina. Good evening, everyone, from beautiful Albuquerque, New Mexico, where a nearly full moon rose above the Sandia Mountains tonight and reminded me that I'm so fortunate to live in such a beautiful place. Um, as has already been said, I'm Tina Cordova. I'm the co-founder of the Tularosa Basin Downwinders Consortium. The TBDC is a 16-year-old organization that was founded to bring attention to the negative health effects suffered by the people of New Mexico as a result of their overexposure to radiation from the Trinity test site. I wanna thank you, Ken, for inviting me to participate tonight so that I could um, again with great honor <clears throat> represent the people of New Mexico who were the first people ever exposed to radiation. Um, we have been dealing with this for over 75 years with no recognition and no assistance. And what's most amazing about this is that the government has controlled the messaging around the Trinity site and what took place there in regards to the indigenous and people of color who lived in the vicinity. The government said then and continues to say today that it was an area that was remote and uninhabited. But we know from census data that there were tens of thousands of people, men, women, and children living within a 50 mile radius of the Trinity test site and some of us lived as close as 12 miles to the test site. So the day of the detonation, we weren't warned. Even after the detonation, we weren't warned. And we were people that relied very heavily on our environment for the production of our food sources and for the collection of water for drinking and cooking purposes. And, and we were basically never given um, any warning and, and never been recognized in 75 plus years we recently found out, and it's something that I share with people every chance I get, that we actually had a, a very big spike in infant mortality in the months after um, the test at Trinity. After a 10 year decline in infant mortality in New Mexico, we actually saw the, this spike in infant mortality in the months just after Trinity. And so I tell everybody, we actually had casualties as a result of Trinity and they were our babies. And when the government was given an opportunity to address that, they decided to do what they'd been doing all along, and that was lie and obscure the truth and move on. And so I'm here tonight to basically uh, represent the people of New Mexico who've been relegated to nothing, nothingness for 75 years, who've been left out here on our own. I'm a downwinder. I'm a cancer survivor. I've had lots of loss in my own personal family but my family is nothing like some of those I've encountered. 
And so we do this work passionately, passionately, and our ultimate goal is to be included in what's called the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act that was established 31 years ago and has been um, paying reparations to other downwinders. Just an aside, New Mexico is also downwind of the Nevada test site, but we have never been recognized as downwinders of the Nevada test site, and that is very well documented. And so with that, uh, I think I'll sort of just defer to the next person and wait until people might develop some questions for me. Thank you, Danielle. Thank you so much, Tina. And Mary Dixon, you're up. All right. I am, um, thank you again, you can, for doing this. I am a downwinder. I'm growing up a child of the Cold War. I ate vegetables from the garden, drank milk from a local dairy, and would mix sugar with um, snow to pretend it was ice cream. So how were any of us to know at that time that a silent poison was threading its way through our bodies? I watched as my eight-year-old friend came to school with her head shaved and died shortly after that. And as her younger brother died of testic testicular cancer three weeks later, um, and I watched his other neighbors develop cancer and other strange tumors. I was 29 when I was diagnosed with thyroid cancer. Two friends were diagnosed about the same time I was. After that, I began keeping a list of the people in my childhood neighborhood who had cancers or other diseases. And that list now numbers 54 people. It includes my older sister who died at age 46 of lupus. My um, younger sister who's battling a rare stomach cancer and my youngest sister who's riddled with autoimmune disorders. It's been three decades since the last US nuclear test, but we are still living with fallout. People are still getting sick. Their cancers are returning. They have other health complications and the genetic damage can be passed down. Um, according to one epidemiologist, the effects of radiation exposure can show up anytime during a lifetime. Sometimes I feel like I'm forever piling up losses. Too many of the people I know, including other activists I've worked with on this issue, have died of their cancers. My mentor, Preston Truman, who's basically one man movement, was diagnosed with a second cancer last year and is now in hospice, not expected to live long. Um, it's going to be devastating to lose him. Sometimes I feel like I'll be the only one left from that tight knit group. And as we go, our stories go with us, which is why I'm passionate about telling them and doing this work. The, the tragedy and suffering that nuclear tests have caused across this country deserves to be acknowledged. It's important to have this National Day of Remembrance, um, but we also deserve justice. There's no question that the government lied, that it lied and covered up and misled us for 40 years, that it sickened its own people through the 928 nuclear tests at the Nevada test site. 100 of those were above ground, all more powerful than what devastated Hiroshima and Nagasaki. There's a map that Richard Miller did in his book, Under the Cloud, The Decades of Nuclear Testing, and it shows how far the fallout spread. It goes all the way across the country to upstate New York and into Canada. Um, that had severe health consequences for the people living downwind. And I know what fallout did to the people in the black areas on his map. I comfort them, I mourn them, I am one of them. Um, I remember that Michelle Thomas used to always say that we were veterans of the Cold War, only no one will ever put a flag over our graves and we certainly never enlisted. I mean, studies have shown for decades a clear link between radiation and cancers and other deadly illnesses. So the country has a responsibility to make right the injustice of the past. We need more than a day of commemoration, but it's um, we've got the Radiation Exposure Compensation Act that was mentioned, but it's just one step and it's always been far too narrow in scope. It offers those with a specific cancer who lived in a specific area during specific times 
$50,000 compensation, which doesn't even cover one chemo treatment. Rika, by the way, expires in July of 2022. There are bills now in the House and Senate to expand compensation so that all of Utah and 10 other states, including New Mexico, I'm happy to say, um, as well as Guam and the Mariana Islands would be covered. The House bill was introduced by Utah's former Congressman Ben McAdams, a real hero, but sadly, no other members of Utah's delegation have signed on to either bill. Um, it's long past time to expand compensation. More importantly, justice cannot be served until governments commit to never again test nuclear weapons. We have to reaffirm our resolve to do everything we can to rid the world at last of these weapons. Because if we've learned anything at all from being the unwitting victims of nuclear testing and weapons, it is that we all live downwind. Thank you, Mary. Next, we have Leona Morgan. Good evening. Thank you for inviting me here today. Um, I am from the Navajo Nation. My family's from Northwestern New Mexico. And while I can understand um, where all of you are coming from, I myself wasn't impacted in the same way. It's my relatives living on the Navajo Nation where there was a lot of uranium mining um, who developed cancers and various illnesses. Um, and, this is, and this is how I came into the fight to stop new uranium mining. Um, I just want to acknowledge there are um, some people I want to just honor tonight who have also fought um, the nuclear industry, not just uranium mining, but the entire nuclear fuel chain. And some of them um, have just recently passed. So I just, if I could dedicate at least my talk to some of these um, uh, heroes of mine, um, including Deb Abrahamson up in the Washington state, Noel Marquez down in the um, Southeastern part of New Mexico and uh, Deborah Whiteplume um, in South Dakota. And, um, and others, there's countless others, as well as those who put their lives on the line um, and, and, and who actually you know, go to jail to, to, to continue the fight. Um, again, I just wanna honor some more folks with the Kings Bay Plowshares 7. Um, tonight, I just wanna bring the conversation to the victims of the uranium mining um, and, and other parts of the nuclear fuel chain who are also impacted um, not just by the weapons complex, but also nuclear energy, um, because you cannot have one without the other. They're very connected. Um, yet our movements to fight nuclear energy and nuclear weapons seems a little bit disjointed at times. And I'd, I'd love for us to bridge that gap, at least here in the United States. Um, I know that the uranium that was used in all of the first um, tests, the, the first tests and then the two bombs that were dropped on Japan, uh, came from uh, the former Belgian um, Congo, which is now the Democratic Republic of the Congo, from the Shinkolobwe uranium mine. And I, um, I'm in contact with some of the folks who are working on this issue, and their stories are very similar to our stories as people living near abandoned uranium mines. Um, the workers were not informed of the dangers. The, the, the mining there was done by hand. and um, they you know, suffered not just health impacts, but of course, contamination to their environment. And now there's talk about reopening that mine. And right now, um, I just wanna center those people living there around the area and their families, because we all share the same, the same impacts to our, to our loved ones. Right now in the United States, there are over 15,000 abandoned uranium mines and no cleanup. Um, and definitely no enforcement of cleanup of, the, of those mines, which were mostly for weapons. Today, um, mines are supposed to be cleaned up after the companies have um, completed their extraction or exhausted their permits, but cleanup is done very poorly and essentially results in permanent waste sites. And if we don't do something about these 15,000 abandoned uranium mines across the country, we're gonna end up with 15,000 abandoned uh, permanent waste sites. There was an effort recently, um, thanks to Charmaine Whiteface and others who started an initiative called, called Clean Up the Mines, which was to focus on getting um, federal funding and enforcement of cleaning up these mines. 
However, that didn't go very far. The cost of cleanup is, is, is tremendous. There is some cleanup happening on Navajo Nation. Um, they've identified 523 abandoned uranium mines and mine lands. Um, again, the cleanup is, is contingent on funding, which is not, is not very readily available. And um, I'd like to share later, if I could, a slide of some of the proposals for cleanup right now, um, which are very, very um, horrible plans, basically to clean up a mill by pile, clean up a mine, cleaning up a mine in Church Rock by piling on top of the mill where the 1979 Church Rock spill happened, essentially creating um, the, the circumstances for allowing a second Church Rock spill, which people don't know about, which happened on July 16th, 1979, the same day as a Trinity test. So I just like to, again, thank everyone. Um, thank you for inviting me here. And yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you, Leona. And our final panelist is Trisha. Hi, okay. Thank you very much to you, Ken, for including Hanford in this discussion. Um, many people don't know much about Hanford. It's, um, so I'm gonna talk just a second about what, what it was and what it did. Um, Hanford began operations in late 1944, releasing radiation in, secretly into the air and waters of the Columbia River on which we had nine, eventually nine plutonium production reactors. So the first group of people in the, pretty much in the US to get exposed were the people living right next to Hanford in late 1944. Unfortunately, the plutonium that was used in the Trinity test was produced at Hanford, and the plutonium that was uh, used in Fat Man was produced at Hanford. And as well, uh, many of the tests, both at the Nevada test site and in the Pacific Proving Grounds were fueled by Hanford's plutonium. Um, I was born and raised right next to Hanford, and I don't know if people know too much about this, but we are nowhere in the even the thoughts of the people that are contemplating RECA. We had litigation uh, with 5,000 plaintiffs involved. It was personal injury litigation for radiation injuries, including cancers, autoimmune disease, um, reproductive disorders, birth defects. So 5,000 plaintiffs in 1990 filed personal injury lawsuits. This was uh, filed under Price Anderson, uh, public liability cause of action. We weren't prohibited by the Warner Amendment as were the Nevada test site folks because this was not above ground testing. This was fallout produced by production. So that we are kind of like the silent group of downwinders. We got 750,000 plus curies of radio iodine plus a whole lot of other stuff in the air and in the waters of the Columbia. But um, we were, it was a quiet site. There were no mushroom clouds. There was no, no explosion. It was just this silent place where nobody was told what was happening. And we all lived there in this wonderful little town called Richland which was where all the employees lived. And it just looked like, as Kate Brown said, it looked like Plutopia, you know, like a little utopia with white picket fences. And uh, so as I grew up, I uh, first I was exposed in utero because my mom was inhaling all the stuff in the air, plus uh, radio iodine passes across the placental barrier. So I was getting that from, I think it's five months and on, the fetus will, at that, so my thyroid started to kill itself through an autoimmune process. And by the time I was about eight, it started to really, I, I didn't have health problems until after a latency period, which happens after a lot of low dose ionizing radiation exposure. But um, a lot of us now who grew up there and grew up throughout the Pacific Northwest, where we also got exposure from Nevada test site that wafted over and global tests that were happening during the Cold War. We're getting it from three directions. Um, a lot of us have the same illnesses as people downwind of Trinity or Mary's people. I mean, these are the same injuries because the same radionuclides in slightly different mixes are coming out of all these sources. Um, I just wanted to say that the litigation dragged on for 25 years, and um, which is incredible. And the reason it dragged on so long was that the uh, 
contractors who used to run Hanford, who we sued, were indemnified by the government for any cost they needed to defend against the downwinders claims. So they spent over $80 million of taxpayer dollars, our very own taxpayer dollars against our claims, which practically bankrupted our attorneys. So as to Hanford, only a few people, including myself, got very small settlements. Two people, two bellwethers, which are representative plaintiffs, got jury trial, jury uh, verdicts, which is the first time in history that a US jury has given verdicts to people injured downwind of US nuclear weapons production or testing sites. But we have really, most of them, most people have received nothing. So just to let you know, we're, we're also in the same boat with everybody else. Um, so that's kind of what I wanted to say, just introduce people to Hanford and tell you we're part of the group. We have the same diseases. We've been ignored and lied to just like everybody else. And it's an honor to be with everyone. And, and I think through speaking us together and working together, that's how we get some power. Thank you so much. Thank you, all of you. This is such a wonderful group that we've got together tonight. And so now we're going to turn the time to those of you that are watching through our YouTube stream. Um, so please enter your questions and uh, I'll be the moderator and I'll, I'll, I'll choose questions to ask out of the ones that you're providing. But I'm going to start with a question and this one will go to all the panelists. And, the, and, and, and some of you spoke a little to this in your opening comments, um, especially with the discussion of, of Rika, but what specific um, compensation or forms of reparation are your groups, are each of your groups seeking for downwinders? And uh, how about Tricia, why don't you start with that one and, and I'll, I'll call on each of you. Thank you. Um, I feel, and I think a lot of the people I work with feel that RECA is exceptionally important, but the attempt to keep expanding it by various congressional <clears throat> representatives, which has been, I, I admire these people, but every time one group looks for compensation, the group next door, which was exposed to exactly the same high levels of radiation is excluded. So we have this sort of uh, infighting that can happen between groups of downwinders. So my thought <clears throat> that I've shared with many people is that we should have a program that's, that's uh, modeled on the EEOICPA, which is the Nuclear Workers' Compensation Act, in which radiogenic diseases are listed. Uh, there's a list of them that have been recognized as radiogenic, and that anyone who is a downwinder who lived during release years downwind of any nuclear weapons production or testing site and develops any of those cancers or diseases should be eligible for compensation and care. That expands this out to the entire nation. Otherwise, we're going to be fighting over, you know, I would love Mary's group to be included, but why aren't they, right? And because the National Cancer Institute study in 1997 showed that other areas that aren't currently covered by RECA got higher exposures than the areas that are covered. So if we could expand this and think nationally and model it on this Nuclear Worker Compensation Act, I think that's a good place to start. So that's what I wanna say about that. Thank you so much. Leona, we'll go to you next. So again, uh, specific forms of compensation or reparations that your groups are seeking. Um, well, our group, the groups I work with actually don't work on RECA, but I think um, one of the most important um, populations are the post-71 uranium workers. And so uranium miners and millers who worked after 1971 are not compensated. Um, and they definitely should be included as well as other workers um, who worked at uranium mine sites or milling sites and the downwinders who lived near these places. Um, as I mentioned, the cleanup is not really um, very, it's not very well funded. And I know when we talk about RICO, we're talking about human health and most of the folks who live around these places, like all of you have said, are experiencing ongoing health impacts um, and to their, to their children and their grandchildren. And so what they've been calling for, um, specifically, I'm thinking of the people at the Redwater Pond Road community north of Church Rock, um, near the spill that I mentioned, they lived in between three uranium mines and adjacent to one uranium mill. And they have been asking for comprehensive health studies. So this includes not just the human health, but all of our relatives, including um, the plant and animal life that is also impacted by exposure to ionizing radiation. 
And let's go to Mary next. Okay, um, I, I completely agree with Trish that Rika is not broad enough to, and that we need to look at including everyone who is a downwind along that whole chain from production to uranium mining, to testing, to waste disposal. I mean, all of these people are downwinders and there's a group right now that is looking at mapping all of that, like Richard Miller mapped just the fallout because um, the victims of nuclear westing, nuclear, nuclear testing are very widespread. And the government has lied to everyone about it, misled everyone and doesn't really want to compensate. When you look how much our government has spent on nuclear weapons production and our arsenal and related programs, it's $1.2 trillion. So we know the money's there. Um, it's just a matter of priorities. And I do think Perhaps, I mean, RECA is only adding 10 more states. And I know one of those states is Oregon, one is Texas. I'm not sure why it's not Washington, Trish, but it's really hard to like get our congressional leaders to focus on this when there's so much else going on. But I'm wondering if you, some of your representatives, Trish, can't get in touch with Senator Crapo of Idaho who sponsored the Senate bill and Ben McAdams of Utah, who sponsored the House bill, because it does seem that we need to expand it so that people understand how widespread the human, staggering human cost of nuclear weapons in this country has been. Thank you. And Tina. Well, it's always um, interesting to me that, and I agree with Mary and Tricia, and, and Leona, but it's always interesting to me that when we've been in Washington DC and we've asked the question why, the answer is always that we don't have enough money to, to fund expanding RECA to cover all the downwinders that are out there. And that's not acceptable any longer because let me tell you something else we've learned recently. We've learned that downwinders are a special cohort inside of a pandemic. Mm -hmm. And, and what I mean by that is that because of our pre-existing conditions, because of our cancer treatments, because of all of the health issues we're left with as downwinders, we're more affected inside of a pandemic. And I clearly believe that's one of the reasons mm -hmm. the Navajo people have had such a difficult time with this disease because there's so many people there with lung disease, underlying cancers and health issues that predispose them for a terrible outcome. And so right now we're passing bills uh, in Congress, which are necessary, don't get me wrong, these are necessary bills, but they're passing you know, $2 trillion bills uh, without a second thought. So to put the money where it needs to be um, as it relates to taking care of us uh, I don't think they can use that as an excuse anymore. And I think it's so very important. The, the best thing that's going to come out of tonight is that now I know Mary and now I know Tricia, and we have to start a national coalition that addresses this issue nationally. There is no reason why anybody should be left out. We're going to get one shot at this and one shot only. The, the idea, um, I was recently in a conversation uh, that Ben Ray Lujan, our congressman, organized um, with Representative Chairman Nadler of the Judiciary Committee. Imagine that we've had bills introduced for 10 years to expand RICA, and we've only had one Senate hearing and never a hearing in the House. It's outside of imagination that they could so conveniently ignore us. We can't let that be part of what happens any longer. And I really do believe that we could put together a coalition especially if we engage our individual members of Congress and say, look, this has to happen and you all have to work on this. And this may be our window to do something like this um, because there's, there's a lot of nuances to this also that, are, uh, that might be really relevant right now. For example, in New Mexico, the people that were most affected by all of the, you know, all of the processes that take place here have been people of color. And, you know, we have to recognize that there's been environmental racism that are, that's part of this whole equation. And um, it's time though, for us to work as a solid national coalition that represents the interests of all the downwinders who have given so much. I mean, I always say we've given everything to this. What else do you want us to give? You know, 
We, we bury our loved ones on a regular basis and we have nothing left to give. And it's, it's ridiculous to tell us we're, we're really sorry, but we just don't have the money to do this. That, that's, not, that's not a viable excuse any longer. And, and I do think that there are some things that exist right now, like this pandemic and pointing out the idea that we're a special cohort inside of, of this pandemic and, and putting together this national coalition, I think is a necessity if we're actually gonna do this and modeling it like EOICBA is an incredible idea, Trisha. I've never really heard anybody say that before, but in my mind, that's an incredible, at the very least, it has to be modernized. We have to push for $150,000 one-time payment and health care coverage. And so, you know, it's our one shot at it. And I think we have a lot of attention right now. And I think we need to capitalize on all of that. Thank you so much, Tina. So we have a question from, um, sorry, I have to scroll and get back to it. Patty Dominguez, and she asked the question of, what is the plan or what are some elements of a plan to allow for working with the greatest number of organizations uh, nationally and globally? So I'll, I'll, and I know some of the comments um, hinted on that, but if anybody would like to jump in and talk about some of the strategies that would be useful to work nationally and globally. I, Mary, I see your hand up. Yeah, I think it's, um, Trisha and I were both on that. Um, 75 years still here panel. And those were groups from across the country and some internationally. There are a lot of groups out there who are working on this. Um, and I think one good way is to just hook up with those groups and let them know you wanna be part of it and you wanna be on their list because there are groups working on it. They aren't necessarily downwinders themselves, which is why I think it's so important for us to be involved and for us to keep telling our stories because I, I do think stories are our most powerful tool. And, and I think it would really help. I, I loved what um, Leona said. We need to get together a coalition of downwinders from all aspects of nuclear weapons um, here in this country. And I'd love to work with you ladies. Thank you. Any, any other comments on that question of uh, yeah. organizing nationally? Yeah, great. One more comment, if I might, uh, with regard to EOICPA. I don't know how you pronounce it. There's some way of saying it. I don't know what it is. The Nuclear Worker Compensation Act gives the benefit of the doubt to the worker. So yeah. this is another thing it does that we need. So if I can't prove what my exposure was because nobody measured how much I was getting as a kid, then I shouldn't be jeopardized. And so I think that's another aspect of the work, Nuclear Worker Compensation Act that we could use uh, that's important. So we wouldn't have to prove what our dose was, et cetera, et cetera, to be eligible. So I just want to say that. Well, I, Danielle, if I could, I, I think the one thing I would say is that in answer to Patty's question is that uh, a, a, an event like this where uh, we get to actually talk as, as individuals representing downwinders um, is a start into a process and do we have a national strategy? No, we don't, but this could be the start of a national strategy. And I'm grateful for the opportunity. I think our, I know our organization would be grateful for an opportunity to work more, more nationally. And we, we actually, like I said, because the 75th anniversary was this last year of not just Trinity, but Hiroshima and Nagasaki, we have a lot of international support right now that we've received and more people know about us than ever before, about the whole downwinder issue. And so this is the time, I believe. You're here. Thank you, Leona. Did you have something to add? Um, yeah, I, well, I mean, there's a, there's a couple points I wanted to make, um, especially regarding um, national or international organizing. Um, because I do, I do work on, I do work with groups both nationally and internationally on different issues related to, um, for example, the, um, the climate issue, um, the client dealing with people, even, even, um, Biden right now, Biden's administration, uh, looking at nuclear energy as a way for, um, you know, as a transition to renewables or that it's necessary to, to curb climate change. Um, this is, uh, one of the biggest lies that we need to dispel. And, and some of the young people, young people are, also, you know, regurgitating 
this fallacy. And I think part of the issue is just not having a lot of young people in this movement. And so that's that's one of the biggest issues I see um, in, in most of the organizing that I do. It's I'm often one of the youngest people. And so our organization in Albuquerque, we started uh, specifically to bring in young people. And there's just a real lack of um, organizing structure and like um, trainings and that kind of thing. I know a while back there was Think Outside the Bomb, which which had a pretty good model for bringing in young people um, that's not around anymore. But so those are two aspects. I think if we wanted to work together nationally and internationally, we would definitely have to bridge the gap between like the peace movement and then the people fighting the energy issues. Um, in New Mexico right now, one of our biggest fights is against Holtec. Um, Holtec International wants to build the world's biggest nuclear waste dump here for high level radioactive waste. And so we have started a national coalition to deal with that. It's the National Radioactive Waste Coalition, but we're mostly focused uh, on, the, on the energy side. So I noticed people, a lot of folks, it's a small community um, internationally, experts in Japan, no experts in New Mexico, and experts in you know Germany and all over the world, people know each other yet we don't work together. Um, and I think it's just you know an, an interesting thing because of how nuanced the nuclear industry and the fight is. Um, and it was all by design. The when when the um, AEC started you know anything nuclear, they created this whole language of nuke speak, and it's designed to be in secret. And and we kind of are mimicking you know, this design of how they separated all the different parts of the nuclear fuel chain and spread it out all over the country. And, you know, we don't see each other. We don't see, I've never been to Hanford. I, I don't, you know, Metropolis, all these places. Um, so I think in order for us to work together, we need to, first of all, build relationships with each other. And that takes time and a lot of just listening and talking. And then, you know, hopefully we can all coalesce and, and, and build our power in that way, not only to stop the energy aspect, but also, of course, weapons, since technically it's supposed to be illegal now. Thank you all for those great responses. So I've noticed in the, in the comments, uh, we have a, a woman, Anne Solentrop, who was noting um, St. Louis folks and Kansas City folks that are also not being covered by RECA or at least not recognized um, as part of what we're really seeing from all of the comments of our panelists is not just national, but a really international network of folks. So the next question we have is um, from Casey from the YouTube channel. And he says, this is for any of the panelists. Do you think that the TPNW will be an effective way for other nations to start putting pressure on the United States of America? Okay, I'll say, I think it's hard to say how effective it will be, but I think it's very important that they keep pressuring the US to sign on to that. I think it's important that we get the comprehensive comprehensive test ban treaty. Biden has said he is for that. So I'm more hopeful with this administration, but there needs to be support and pressure for that or, or who knows how effective it will be. But I definitely think that is helpful. It's helpful. Anyone else comment on that? Okay, we have another question. This actually piggybacks a little on what Mary just said, mentioning Biden. So we have a question from one of our UCAN members. Nuclear weapons are clearly dangerous. What steps would you like to see President Biden take to decrease this danger? And this is for any of the panelists. Okay, can I, I just add this? There's an excellent article that came out just today in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Um, and it is the titles Why Biden Should Push for Ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. She lays it out so well. Look it up. It's in the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, Why Biden Should Push for Ratification of the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. Um, she's hopeful with him in office, and I, I'm feeling very hopeful as well. But she lays it all out so well, better than anything I could say. Look it up. Thank you. Trisha, Tina, or Leona, any actions that, that 
should happen on the executive presidential level? Well, I just think uh, from my perspective, it's refreshing that we have uh, a president that's not talking about testing nuclear weapons. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's obviously some, some signals being sent that he is fully aware of the very dangerous place we were even a few months ago. And uh, so it's important, I think, for me and from my perspective as a downwinder, for people to understand that when you modernize, for example, they throw around words like we're gonna modernize our nuclear arsenal. None of those things can happen without testing and resuming testing would be an absolute horrible idea. And I always say, just talk to one of us, talk to us about what happens as a result of nuclear testing. There is no safe process for nuclear testing. They'll say that. And I always say this as sort of a response to that idea or the idea of storing high level nuclear waste in New Mexico. They always tell you those things are safe mm -hmm. and they are seemingly safe right, right up until the minute they're not. And then it's catastrophic and nobody comes back. We've been dealing with this for 75 years and no one's ever looked back. And so to have a president that's talking about uh, test ban treaties and, and, and walking back some of the things that have happened over the last four years is refreshing for me, but it has to go further than that. We have to see a shift in where the Department of Energy puts their money. And I think that very soon, once we have a new secretary of the Department of Energy, we may start to see even some shifts there because we need to take money away from pit production and put it into taking care of people's health. The things that we're all talking about tonight. And so for me, I'm waiting to see what happens at the Department of Energy with their budget and whether they start talking about renewable energy uh, and, and retooling our, our labs, for example, and taking money away from pit production. We don't need any more plutonium pits, taking money away from plutonium pits and putting it someplace where it actually might do some good. The other thing that people forget is that when those of us who are downwinders have adequate resources to take care of our health and, and they, they, you know, they, they give us reparations and they provide us with health care coverage, that money goes right back into the economy and it actually creates its own economy. This is not just um, an issue of taking care of us. It's about developing an economy all around that process of taking care of our health. And for, for us, there's another side to this that people sometimes don't understand. Uh, when, you when you have to spend everything that you have to take care of your health, you land up not having an opportunity to uh, develop any kind of generational wealth. And so there's a lot of downside to what we've been through that nobody ever talks about the economy of what it is to be a downwinder and what the how that economy changes when all of a sudden you have everything you need to take care of your health. So for me, I'm just grateful that we have a president that's walking back some of the really dangerous things that uh, were going on and, and is talking about things that might take us in a very positive direction away from the really dangerous things that were, that were being discussed recently. Thank you, Tina. I, Leona had a response and then um, after that, you, Tricia. Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, there's several things he can do, um, you know, through executive order. And then, of course, as Tina mentioned, his appointments. Um, I think right now um, we, we just heard from, from him yesterday uh, that, you know, he's, he wants to work on racial equity. And he even mentioned, you know, honoring tribal sovereignty. Um, I think these are great um, areas to, you know, points of entry into you know, working with the Biden administration. And then today the focus was on environmental justice. And so um, besides those, those these, are, these are great initiatives. And I think we just need to, you know, hold him and his administration accountable, um, especially to some of the promises he made about reversing some of the um, things that, that were done with the last administration, um, like shrinking, you know, Bears Ears, for example, which is in, in your area and also, you know, a sacred place to a lot of indigenous peoples. And so I think, you know, it, we can't just like hold him accountable to, to, to specifics that he mentioned, but educate them on across the board on some of the other places that also deserve and really need protection, not just from uranium mining, but all, all aspects of the nuclear fuel chain. Um, 
like specifically with uranium mining under the 1872 mining law, mining was a tool of colonization. And so land ownership, you know, was possible that the legalization of the theft of our lands. Um, so I would take it all the way back to, to that and, and work on, you know, giving our, well, not giving, but for us to get our land back, especially if you think about Los Alamos labs and the, the people, all of the indigenous peoples that live in these places, not only has their land been taken, but it's been contaminated. And so these are things that we also need to work to hold the Biden administration accountable. And so it's new. So he can't just say, oh yeah, we honor tribal sovereignty and environmental justice. Um, we got to do the work to hold them to it. So yeah, that's it. Thanks. Trisha. Oh, thanks. Um, I just wanted to say that as we think of all these ideas, as a downwinder who's quite health impacted, that's me, I have all kinds of issues, plus no thyroid anymore, hypoparathyroidism, all the stuff that a lot of us have. I get overwhelmed just when we talk about all these topics and it makes me tired. And so we have to be really careful when we're working with health impacted people. And as Tina mentioned, many of these folks, the ones I interviewed for my book, have multiple health problems and they, they're not rich because they haven't been able to earn an income because of their disabilities related to their exposures. We have to be gentle when we approach people and we have to triage the subject matter. Otherwise people go, that's too much. I can't deal with this. You know, so you have to almost say, we're gonna do this first. Are you interested? And then I mean, it's just for energetic people, all this sounds great. But as I listen, I go, oh, wow. You know, either one of these topics would be like, I think I need a nap. You know, really, that's because there's a lot of chronic fatigue involved when you're an exposure uh, person, person who is exposed. So I just wanted to mention that as a caution. Yeah, I, I think it's to the very people who need to be advocating for themselves, <laughs> the people who are often too sick to do it. I, yeah. I remember a friend of mine who died not long ago said, you have to keep doing this fight for us, Mary, because you're the only healthy one. Human energy. Well, well, you have your issues, but you have energy more than some people do. You know, I mean, it's all relative, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm going to make sure we leave some time for closing comments. So I'm going to combine a couple of um, questions for our final question. I'm going to ask everyone to speak to this one. So um, it's, I guess I'll make it a two-part question. Uh, the, the question from a UCAN member is, what are some action steps that audience, audience members can take to support downwinders to, um, in a sense, do what Trisha and Mary were just talking about. Sometimes we, we don't need to place all the burden on the downwinders to be advocating. And then to combine that with a question uh, that came over the YouTube channel is, um, how can we help more people see how important this issue is and, and how to help them care about this issue? So that kind of two-pronged action steps for these wonderful audience members that have joined us tonight and, and suggestions for helping helping to, to spur people to care about this. And uh, Trisha. Okay, just real quickly, um, I feel that the, the, just like Mary said, the more of us who share our stories, the yeah. more shocked the public is and the more they wake up. I mean, I have 24 stories in the book we just wrote. People are always writing to me going, I had no idea it was that bad. You know, so if we could just, if people could help record stories at these different sites, you know, if they could volunteer their time to help with oral histories and then put them online, I think it would be hugely helpful. Yeah. Thank you. How about Tina? Well, we have a website. It's www.trinitydownwinders.com. And very soon we'll have a strategic plan there that will instruct people on what they can do to assist us. And really, it's outreach. You need to, if you're committed to helping us, and I will say, Tricia and Mary, every time we speak to anybody, any time we tell our stories to people and they hear our stories, they can't help but feel compassion for what we've been through. And they always say, I had no idea. And that's the really shocking part of this, that our government has been so good at controlling the messaging that nobody realizes that in this whole entire process of developing and testing uh, nuclear devices, that they damage tons of people, lots of people, and that we still deal with it. And this isn't going anywhere. Mary talked earlier about the genetic component to this. 
this isn't going any place. And then Leona talked about how hard it is to get young people to understand why this is important. Well, like I said earlier, we were just, our government was just speaking a few months back about testing nuclear devices. It's an issue for everyone, even young people. And we do need to engage. We have a really difficult time, but we, let me tell you one of the things that's real effective that we do, we get invited to speak and we take advantage of every opportunity, especially if it's to a group of young people. So we, we do lecturing at the University of New Mexico and other colleges in New Mexico so that we can engage young people. And it always generates volunteers. We have volunteers right now from the university who are doing all kinds of special projects for us. But I want to just get back to how we share information. Our website will soon have a strategic uh, legislative plan for how we're going to try to move forward. That's probably going to have to be tweaked a lot after tonight because I think I will now be able to work closely with other people like Mary and Tricia. But call your representatives, your senators, your House members. Make sure they understand that this is an issue that is of grave concern to you. That, and I always tell everybody, this is a social justice issue and it's a moral and an ethical issue. What does it say about a country that poisons its own people and then walks away? Okay, this is a moral and ethical issue. We should not cloud it with anything else. And we should all dedicate ourselves to saying, wait, this was not right. This was a huge injustice that was done to American tax paying citizens. Okay, and, and, and I won't stand for it any longer. And I want you to ask for a hearing in the Senate Judiciary. And I want you to ask for a hearing in the House Judiciary and put pressure on. Because if they only hear from Mary and Tricia and Leona and me and other people like us, and that's all, they don't think it's an issue for them. But it is an issue. And I think that that's how people need to get involved and share the stories that we've shared and send people to our websites, um, to Tricia's book, to, you know, to, to, to the work Mary has done, the work Leona has done. And, and there's so much out there. All you have to do is Google search downwinders and you, you'll be shocked at all you'll find. There are stories at our website. If people want to just say, go to Trinity Downwinders website, www.trinitydownwinders.com. And, and we have posted all kinds of stories there. And, and if people are interested, they can have others go there and read the stories for themselves so that they can get a, a taste for what this is like. And, and interestingly enough, there's four of us on this, this, you know, on this Zoom. And I have never asked Leona this question, but of four of us here, Three of us who are definitely downwinders have no thyroids. What does that tell you? It's not like you put the call out and said, okay, ladies, we just want you that don't have thyroids to participate. That's proof of what we're saying. I mean, I don't have a thyroid. I got thyroid cancer when I was 39. And everybody in my family has thyroid disease. And almost all the ladies I know who grew up where I do either have no thyroid, or had thyroid cancer or on thyroid medicine. There, it does it. It's not discerning everybody got, everybody has it. And it's just shocking to me that you assembled a group of women downwinders and none of us have a thyroid. That is something, yeah. Leona, do you wanna give us some action steps or strategies to evoke more care? Yeah, um, I'm, I'm really happy. Um, uh, Tina mentioned earlier the connection between COVID and, and you know, connecting it to uranium mining as not just the health impacts have hurt us, but also we've you know, been dealing with a lack of water resources. Obviously we all, we're in the desert Southwest, but also because a lot of our water resources were contaminated by uranium mining and coal mining and that kind of thing. And so I think um, you know, some ways to um, get people involved and activated is to also focus on the inter intersectionality of the work at any given time, there are public comment periods. Um, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission is right now entertaining a really horrible cleanup plan. I'm going to put some of the links in the in the YouTube chat for how people can send comments. Um, the deadline for comments is um, February 26, and um, I don't know if I can have permission to share my screen just for a second. I can kind of show you. Is is that would that be okay? So um, yeah, right now uh, with the national campaign I mentioned earlier, we're working on several aspects of um, the, the whole tech fight, high level radioactive waste. Um, and so another issue that is, is constantly being entertained by NRC is SMRs. 
um, SM at small modular nuclear reactors. And so pretty much at any given time, people can get involved this way um, by sending comments. So this, this is the proposal I wanted to share with you all. Um, this is a picture of the, the proposal for cleanup um, that's being um, uh, going through a public comment period right now. This is Northeast Church Rock Mine, this purple shape here. This is an old uranium mine that um, they're trying to clean up under the uh, EPA and Navajo Nation five-year plan. And so essentially what they're trying to do, um, I'll put this link in the chat. They want to scrape up the waste from the mine and pile it on top of the mill over here. So here's a cross section. There's already tailings from the mill that have been covered up and they want to basically clean up one site by moving the waste across the street and then covering it again. And so this is um, something that's happening now. I mentioned earlier, it's part of um, this. This is the mill where the 1979 church truck spill happened. And the community is against this because they say it's in a floodplain. And because of climate change, they're you know thinking there could be a, a big flooding event that would cause all of that waste to eventually get in the Puerco River and then go downstream again. But um, yeah, as I mentioned, there's always public comment periods. This one, um, I can send out some talking points, the deadline's February 26th, but um, there's also a need for alternative types of actions, not just government actions, not just lobbying and, and that kind of thing. Um, last week, we did a little action. It was kind of fun. We you know held up signs and banners, but there's so many opportunities for people to get involved if we can help to localize the issue for people and, and for folks to really own it and, and, and understand it is a national issue and we pay for it through our tax dollars. So, so I think the hard part is getting people to take ownership of the issue and understanding how it impacts them. But um, I'm just saying, not just through um, government, um, uh, any kind of like elected official kind of lobbying or, or public comment periods, but any kind of social activity, social justice work, environmental justice work, and, and, and actions are something I know young people like to do um, more than, you know, going to government offices. So that's all I wanted to, sh to share. Thanks. Thank you, Leona. And Mary, your comments on uh, actions or strategies for a listening care. I just think one thing, and, and this has been mentioned, we have to tell our stories. Nothing has the power of the personal. And that's what I've discovered. And even my play, it was so intensely personal. It got so much response from people because you have to tell your story. I'm just adamant about that. Um, we have to take back the narrative. The government's had it for too long. And people believe that this is something that happened in the past in some remote area and has nothing to do with them. But as we've all, you know, stress tonight, it affected everyone living in the US during years of testing and it continues to affect people because of genetic damage. One thing I do that always has people gasping, I show them this map. I don't know if you can see it. Can you see this map? That shows everywhere fallout went from nuclear testing. And that's all based on the government's own data. They kept map of where every test went when it was picked up by the jet stream. And it is startling. So I, I do think we need to speak out. We need to you know, take advantage of speaking to anyone who asks us talking to student groups because we need to bring up a new generation to take this mantle because we're not all, all going to be around that long. Um, thank God there are young people who have taken it on. And um, I just think it's so important that people realize we are all downwinders. And, and one thing is we cannot assume that our elected officials even know much about all this because they don't. I remember going back to DC a few years ago with two other downwinders and we were going from office to office. And you know what? They didn't know what we we're talking about. And we finally got to Chuck Hagel's office and he, his assistant, whatever his title was, who he sent out to talk to us said, you know, I was aboard a nuclear submarine. I know exactly how bad this is. You've got to tell them they don't know. Um, and that to me is pretty frightening. I, I know in Utah, we've got members of our congressional delegation who don't have a clue about our nuclear past. They don't even know where nuclear testing happened. Um, and so there's a lot of education to do. I just think we have to take advantage of every opportunity to educate people that this is ongoing, that we're still living with the health effects, that it hasn't ended. 
That's the most important thing. It hasn't ended and it affected a staggering number of Americans. Thank you so much, all of you. Those were great suggestions and great things that all of us in the audience need to start doing. And one thing that's really wonderful is that we didn't get to all of the questions. And I know that's disappointing to some people in the audience, but it does show that there are, we have a robust audience tonight that has questions and wants to learn more. And I would urge you to take Trisha's suggestion and, and get on Google and, and learn and connect with uh, these four women, connect with our organizations and uh, continue to learn more. So we've saved the last little bit for each speaker to give uh, about a two minute closing comment, any final words that they want to share with us. So um, I, I'll go in alphabetical order again with our speakers and uh, that would be Tina first. Well, again, I wanna thank you Ken for inviting me to participate and I wanna thank the other panelists. I learned, and I learned so much tonight. Uh, all things that I understand very well, having lived them myself. And I wanna thank everybody who took time out of their schedules tonight to, to be a part of this and part of the audience. And I just wanna say that this is a heavy lift. I've always said this is a heavy lift, but it is something that we can actually get done if we work together. And as I said earlier, this isn't over anytime soon. Um, we've identified, I'm the fifth generation in my family to have cancer since 1945. Mm. I fear for my grandsons and my son every day of my life. I always say it's why I do this work. Uh, I watched my dad die a horrible death. Um, he had cancers that he didn't have risk factors for. I have an aunt, his sister, who is diagnosed last week with breast cancer, a very aggressive type of breast cancer. And these are the lives that we live. Uh, my sister just recently was treated for cancer. I hear Mary and Trisha, and I think it's, it's like I'm hearing my own community. And um, I think that there is a moral and an ethical imperative to right this wrong. And I think the more that we educate people, the more involved they get in the issue. And so I appeal to all of you who are out there tonight to please please, please, please remember that together we can get this done and we need your help and we're asking for your help. And uh, there's so many things that you can do. And if you're compelled to volunteer, please reach out to us. Uh, I'm sure that you can find us uh, through, through UCAN, through our websites, et cetera. Reach out to us. We invite the assistance and we look forward to working together. I look forward to working together with everybody. Thank you. Next is Mary. Um, thank you so much, Deb Sawyer and you can, um, your board and everyone for putting this together. I just am so thrilled with how far reaching it is and the panelists you had. And like Tina, I've just learned a lot and I'm so happy for the opportunity to connect with these women because I do think it's gonna take all of us and a huge coalition to finally arrive at justice and to make sure that this utterly immoral, unethical, unjust um, era of nuclear weapons and their tremendous health consequences will end and that it will never, ever, ever happen again. I, I just want people to know that this is something that should never happen again because as we've said over and over, we are all downwinders. And there, there was a book written called Half Lies and Half Truths by Mary Rose Johnston. I love this quote. She always said, nuclear testing did not prevent nuclear war. It was a nuclear war. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Thank you, Mary. Next is Leona. Yeah, thank you everyone. I'm, I'm really happy to meet you all. And just to answer Tina's question, um, we do have, I do have, um, there are th thyroid problems in my family pulmonary fibrosis and all kinds of cancer. Um, I didn't grow up in a contaminated area, unfortunately, um, but the reason I do the work is because there's, I'm privileged to be able to, to, to have the time and energy to do this kind of thing, kind of, you know, alluding to what Tricia was saying, but um, 
Yeah, I, I really do appreciate this um, time and everyone who's watching. I just want to remind folks that um, the intersectionality of all of the various steps of the nuclear fuel chain from both weapons production and energy production, it they span like every issue. And I think folks can, can connect to any of the intersectionality that is existing within their communities, whether it's reproductive justice, you know, food sovereignty, um, you know, not just health and contamination, it, it really does impact everyone in, in various ways across the country and anyone can really get involved, especially when we look at the entire fuel chain, not just, you know, one aspect in, in separate silos and that we do need unity to come together to make this a national issue and to, to change it, to take away the budget for weapons and military and put it into all of the, the um, programs that we're talking about here tonight. So thank you. Thank you. And Trisha, you're up next. Okay, I think everybody's sort of echoed what I wrote in my closing statement here about the importance of working together. But I actually feel like maybe one thing I'd like to say is a sort of a call to action. If there's anybody in the audience who's affiliated with an organization or academic institution who would be willing to help us record stories from many, many sites around the country and put them online. Um, that's a great way to help us. And it would require contacting the different sites, getting the appropriate permission forms in place, and then putting them online, because then we would have lots of stories, just like Mary said. And after a while, it would be overwhelming to look at. You go, holy cow, did that really happen? So if there's anybody in the audience who would like to do something like that, maybe they could go through you and, and let us know. Uh, there are individual archives right now for Hanford. For There's a great one at the Marriott Library for the Nevada Test Site. But I'm sure Mary worked hard on that one. It's a beautiful, beautiful archives. But they're here and they're there and they're not in one place and they're not easily accessible for all of us together. And so if anybody would be interested in working on that, that'd be fantastic. That's the end of my <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. I am so impressed and um, just this panel of women is so impressive and has told such important, powerful stories. And I don't know how any one of us in the audience can't, after this, take some sort of action to sh share these stories, talk to your Congress people, engage in other forms of activism around these issues. That is, I mean, our speakers gave you lots of actions, but that is, I think, um, what we should all do after hearing these stories is at least commit to taking one action. To that end, Daniel, sorry to interrupt. Um, just before other people leave the, the viewing audience, if, um, if we can have a chance for everybody to give one website, I can type that into the chat on YouTube. That'll help a little bit, but sorry for interrupting, Danielle. No, that's, that's, that's so keep going. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. And I think some of them have been typed into the chat in the Zoom, so maybe you can cross those over. Um, so we'll we'll try to put a website for each of these organizations in the YouTube chat. And I we're at 8.15, so I would like to close by thanking all of you for participating tonight, thanking our panelists and all of those in the audience. If you would like to learn more about the Utah Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, subscribe to this YouTube channel or look at our website, which is utahcan.org. And um, best wishes to everybody and, and go figure out that at least one action that you're gonna commit to tonight after listening to our wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.